I'm going to start with an introduction to Women in Code and our mission of Women in Code and a little bit about the blockchain community. And then I'll hand it over to the amazing Shweta, um, who's our speaker here today, and she'll be talking about system security fundamentals. Um, so my name is Sapphire Duffy, and I'm a leadership fellow here at Women in Code. And if you would like to reach out to me, my email address is sapphirewomenincode.com. And then we have Naomi, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Naomi. I am the other fellow. <laughs> um, and feel free to reach out to me, Naomi, at womenwhocode.com. We are looking for more volunteers in blockchain. We've got a bunch of different things to work on. We're also looking for more speakers. So if you know of anyone um, who's interesting that you'd like to hear from, please send one of us an email. Or if you'd like to speak yourself, um, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. And there, here's our team. So um, we have an amazing um, blockchain team um, who work really hard in leading our community. So a massive appreciation to them. And if you don't know um, already about our mission at Women Who Code, um, Women Who Code is a global nonprofit dedicated to inspiring women to excel and encourage them into technology careers. And um, our vision, um, we envision a world where women are proportionally represented as technical leaders, executives, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers at all levels. So every day at Women Who Code, we try to understand the gaps and what we can do to get more women into technology and help excel them at all levels. And across the world, we have 230 members. Um, we have 70 networks in 20 different countries, and we have uh, this is over 90 sorry, we have members in over 97 countries, and we have hosted over um, 10,000 events, and we give away um, 1,200 sorry, 1,025 $1, um, dollars daily conference tickets and $2 million worth of scholarships. And you can access our jobs and resources um, on our website. And our movement today um, is as the world changes, we um, can be a connecting force that creates a sense of belonging while the world is being asked to isolate. So I want to take this moment to say that we are here for our community. Um, I know times are really tough at the minute, um, but we are all here for each other. And if you need any help or anything, just please reach out to us. And this is our code of conduct. Um, please take a look at our code of conduct and um, follow strict um, the conduct embedded into the community and we encourage our members to have an inclusive mindset so if you feel um, something is not right and um, you can fill out an incident form and we will look into it you can always email um, Naomi um, or, or I as well if you would like and we want this community to be a place where everyone feels safe and our technical track communities so um, last year we got, or maybe two years ago now, um, we got a lot of requests from women um, that they wanted to deep um, dive into technologies. And last year the tracks were created. And um, this is the blockchain track. So um, join the blockchain track if you um, aren't a member already. We host tech talks, workshops, tutorials, training, live streams, um, study groups. And we also have a Slack group. Um, when you join the Slack group, please introduce yourself. I promise you we're a friendly bunch <laughs> and we would love to connect with you. And now I'm going to introduce you to our speaker today, Shweta. Um, she's currently a software engineer um, in the security engineering team at Google and is working on securing Google's technical infrastructure. Prior to this, um, she was working on security features in VMware's cloud platform team. Um, she has been delivering talks in security conferences and has been part of security reviews. And she, ha she has been in the system software in industry for five years now. Um, so yeah, now I'm going to pass it on to you. I'll stop sharing my screen. And remember, if anyone has any questions, please put them into the chat and we will get around to answering them at the end if we have time. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah. <clears throat> 
So hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, uh, like Safa just mentioned, uh, uh, I'm a software engineer at Google, uh, and I've been working on security for a while now. Uh, this talk will be more of an introductory talk to system security <clears throat> and security in general, um, and about how to design secure systems. Uh, let's get right into it. So uh, just going over the agenda, uh, we'll start with uh, going over uh, the usual security concepts. Uh, what are the different security primitives that are usually used uh, across the board in security and applying cryptography in real world systems. And then we look at uh, what things to keep in mind uh, while building secure systems. And because we are in the blockchain track, we'll also talk about the intersection between blockchain and security at the end. Uh, and we'll open up the Q&A after that, but feel free to drop any questions uh, as you might have. So these are some of the common uh, security concepts or security primitives uh, that we hope to achieve uh, when we talk about security in computer systems. Uh, so confidentiality, integrity, availability, non-repudiation, authentication, authorization, accountability. So there are uh, uh, several primitives that we have and uh, we would want to achieve either one or more or most of uh, these, uh, depending on what you're building, uh, your application or your system, whatever you're building. Uh, so we look into what each of these uh, entail and what guarantees you would have to give. Uh, we look at all of this in the perspective of uh, two parties communicating. So in cryptography, they usually call this Alice and Bob communicating with each other. So Alice wants to send either a message or data to Bob. And uh, this needs to be protected in different ways from an active attacker or a passive attacker. And these are called Mallory and Eve. Uh, so uh, what an active attacker is, is essentially someone who can intercept your communication and look at the data when the communication is going on. Whereas a passive attacker is someone who has uh, access to the data after the fact. So after the communication is over, if that person is still able to uh, get that data. So that is a passive attacker. So uh, security would like to, uh, would want to achieve something to prevent these kind of attacks. So the first thing is confidentiality. So confidentiality essentially means that you want to keep uh, the data or the message that you're sending a secret. So whenever someone looks at the communication or uh, even uh, data stored, uh, you don't want to keep it in clear text. So that is what confidentiality is. Essentially, you, you do not want your data to be uh, able to be retrieved just by looking at it. Uh, so that, uh, for example, uh, if you look at real world examples, when, uh, when a backend system is storing passwords, you do not want to store it in clear text, right? You want to encrypt it so that when someone is reading from it, you don't want to see it in clear text. Similarly, uh, whenever you're web browsing, uh, you have noticed the HTTPS these days. So HTTPS uses uh, TLS or SSL to encrypt HTTP requests. So uh, HTTP, on the other hand, is just clear, clear text communication between your web client and web server. Uh, the second primitive is integrity. Uh, integrity, on the other hand, is to ensure that uh, data is not corrupted or tampered with. So uh, unlike confidentiality, it's OK in this case if the data is visible. But uh, the receiver should be able to make sure that this was not tampered with or modified. And it is coming from the sender that was uh, that intended to send it and not from someone else like an attacker <clears throat> attacker or uh, some third party. Uh, again, a real world examples is secure boot of systems. So in the in case of secure boot of systems, uh, when your system or computer is booting up, uh, it loads different modules. It loads your firmware, it loads your bootloader, it loads your operating system. So during secure boot, uh, we usually verify the signature of uh, the module that is being uh, loaded to make sure that the module that is being uh, loaded is the one that is in intended to be, and it's not a malicious binary uh, that can take over a system, right? So that is a system integrity. And uh, the other one, storage in databases. So whenever you're storing user data in your database, uh, when it's being read, you, don't, you obviously don't want it to be corrupted or uh, you know, tampered with. Uh, and you would want uh, integrity in this case when you're storing uh, data in databases. Uh, the next one is authentication. Uh, this is something very commonly used in day-to-day -day life for everybody. So you, a user provides uh, proof of identity uh, to be able to access the data that the sender is trying to send. Uh, so something like a password or biometrics uh, or a token. 
so for example, you, you log in every day to Gmail or uh, uh, your even your computer or your phone with your password or biometrics. So you're providing proof of your identity to be able to authenticate to use the service that you want to, uh, you, you intend to use. The second one, when I say token, uh, so these days you might have noticed that uh, you can log into another website using uh, uh, your credentials from a different website. So for example, you can log into Pinterest with your Gmail ID. So what it essentially it does is it lets you log into your Gmail and uh, get an authentication token to say that, okay, this person uh, is authenticated to use Gmail and I'm giving you this token to use on Pinterest. So that's called OAuth protocol. Uh, so that is another way to authenticate uh, a user uh, to be able to access your services. Uh, the next is authorization. Usually it's confused with authentication, but authorization is a little beyond providing proof of identity. Right? This one is that you provided proof of identity, but are you allowed to use the services? So do you have the right permissions to use the services that the sender is trying to provide? Uh, so before sending the data, the sender would try to look at an access control list, which essentially is a list of uh, privileges that each user has. And only if you have the privileges uh, to access this data, you would be getting the data from the sender. <clears throat> so that is called authorization. And in real world, you would have noticed that in Linux, uh, you will see a root user versus different other users like user one and user two. And the root user has way more privileges than uh, the other users on Linux. So that is an example of like classification of privileges and depending on the privilege, you're, you're getting to do different kinds of operations. Uh, similarly, in cloud accounts, you would have an admin versus user accounts and an admin usually have way, has way more privileges than uh, user accounts uh, can do on the cloud. The la uh, next one is availability. Uh, so as the name suggests, um, your service should always be available to the user. So whenever the user sends requests, uh, whether you're editing out or not, at least the service should be available to uh, take the requests. So why is this uh, a security primitive? So you would have seen a lot of denial of service attacks on servers. So what an attacker can do is they can flood your service with uh, a ton of requests, uh, causing the server to not be able to serve legitimate users. So in that case, availability becomes a security problem. Uh, similarly, in websites, uh, a, a malware can overload the website by injecting a lot of uh, dummy traffic, uh, you know, causing the website to go down. Uh, the last one is non-repudiation. So non-repudiation is the inability to deny a contract or transaction. So I guess blockchain folks would be more familiar with this. Uh, so essentially when you're making, for example, uh, digital payments, uh, you would want to be able to always tie the payment to the owner of the card or uh, the uh, account, right? So you, uh, this primitive ensures that uh, uh, a transaction can never be denied by the person who did it. Uh, similarly, for uh, document ownership, you might have seen digital uh, signatures uh, on documents or books these days, uh, which essentially ties the owner to the, uh, to the file or to the book. So that also is a way of providing non-repudiation. Uh, that is like an intro to all the security primitives. Now let's look at how we can guarantee some or more of these primitives using cryptography. Uh, so uh, again, cryptography is just a tool for security. Uh, it's not all of security. So you can guarantee some of the security primitives like confidentiality and integrity uh, using cryptography, but beyond using crypto algorithms, uh, you would also want to uh, do some other uh, uh, some of the housekeeping such, like, such as uh, uh, like for authorization I mentioned have an access control list uh, and so on. So uh, just having encryption is not sufficient to provide end-to-end -end security. Uh, the next uh, bullet here is uh, do not try to invent your own uh, crypto algorithms. This is uh, this is usually a uh, thumb rule in cryptography. Uh, this is because uh, whenever there's a crypto algorithm that's published and used worldwide uh, it has been vetted, it has been tested uh, intensively and to make sure that it cannot be cracked uh, and with the amount of resources that we have. Uh, and even existing crypto algorithms uh, uh, will be changing as soon as quantum computing becomes a thing. So uh, it would be wise to not try to invent new uh, crypto algorithms, uh, rather choose from existing algorithms and adapt it to your uh, you know, use case and uh, requirements that you have. 
So the most popular uh, use case of uh, cryptography is encryption. Uh, so you're ensuring uh, original data cannot be deciphered from the encrypted data. That is the goal of encryption, right? So when you're encrypting data, you're making sure that someone who looks at the encrypted data cannot get the original data by just uh, reading it. Uh, there are two types of encryption, symmetric and asymmetric encryption. First, we look at what symmetric encryption is. Uh, so uh, the goal of symmetric, and some one of the goals of symmetric encryption is to provide confidentiality. Uh, and in this case, data is encrypted by a secret key, a K, and can be only decrypted by the holder of the same key. So if you look at the first block, uh, you have an encryption algorithm and the encryption algorithm takes the message uh, and the key K as inputs and it delivers the output as a ciphertext or cipher C. And the ciphertext will be mostly uh, indecipherable by anyone who does not have the key. And the decryption algorithm on the other end uh, by Bob uh, will take in inputs as a ciphertext C and the key K again, the same shared key K and will, he will be able to decrypt uh, the ciphertext to give the message M. Uh, so this is uh, widely used mostly in cloud storage where uh, the party who's uh, giving the data as well as the party who's uh, decrypting the data uh, share the same symmetric key K. Uh, and for example, it's uh, used widely in cloud storage. Uh, cloud storage uses it for encryption for confidentiality purposes. One of the popular algorithms is AES, uh, and uh, that's a symmetric encryption algorithm. So essentially you use AES encrypt and AES decrypt. Uh, so AES uh, encryption can be scaled up in strength uh, by increasing the key size. So if you're going to have a key size of 128 bits uh, versus a key size of 256 bits, the one with, uh, if you encrypt with 256 bits, uh, the algorithm is going to be stronger. Uh, so there's a lot of math involved inside, but uh, what you would need to know is how to use uh, the encryption based on uh, your use case. So you would have to take a trade-off between uh, the speed versus the strength of encryption. So the, the lower the key size, faster the encryption, but uh, higher the key size, uh, the strength of encryption is more. So you would want to make a trade-off between this depending on your design. And uh, like I mentioned, the key is shared between the uh, two parties, but what if the key is, uh, you know, compromised? So you would want to make sure the keys are generated by a pseudo random generator so that the keys are random enough that, it, that they are not, uh, they are very hard to guess by an attacker who wants to like, decrypt your uh, data. Uh, the last uh, bullet mentions nonces. So what are nonces? Uh, if you look at this uh, image, whenever you're sending message M1 uh, with the same key K, you would get the ciphertext C1. But uh, even uh, it, when an attacker looks at your uh, ciphertext, if he's able to see the same C1 every time, he's able to decipher that the message has been the same. So essentially, he'll be able to find out that a repeated data is being sent. He was able to see the same ciphertext over and over. So to prevent this, uh, usually nonces or random numbers are added during the encryption phase. So you would send the message, uh, the key K, and uh, a nonce. Uh, to the encryption algorithm so that you get a distinct uh, cipher text for the same message that is being sent. Another uh, use case of symmetric encryption is to provide data integrity. Uh, so these are popular methods called hash functions, uh, which also use uh, symmetric encryption in the background uh, for providing integrity. So what uh, a hash function does is when you're sending a large message uh, through a hash function, you get a short MAC or message authentication code. So HMAC is hashed message authentication code. So uh, when you send like say uh, uh, some 200 bytes of data, you get a short MAC depending on your hash function uh, of like say 256 bits. And uh, the sender appends this message uh, with the tag that is generated. And the receiver verifies the tag using another function, uh, another cryptographic hash function uh, which is something like verify tag, uh, which takes the message, the tag, and the key K as inputs uh, to make sure that the message uh, sender, uh, uh, the message and the tag uh, match such that they have the same, uh, you know, uh, they have the same uh, signature to make sure that the sender has sent the same message and the message has not been tampered with on the way. 
for example, if an attacker is trying to change the message, uh, the tag would uh, you know point out that this is not the message that was sent and it is being tam tampered with because this is not the hash of the same message that was sent. So some of the popular uh, hashing algorithms are in the SHA-2 series. And uh, again, the, uh, the uh, postfix of SHA is the size of the data that you would end up with. So a SHA-256 hashing function uh, would result in a 256-bit hash. Um, so depending on how small or how large you want your hash or tag to be, you would use that particular uh, SHA function. So again, hash functions uh, should be collision resistant. Uh, what that means is when you're sending data D1 through a hash function and the data D2 through the hash function, there should be no way that both the hashes are the same. So H1 and H2 should never be equal. So hash functions should be collision resistant. And again, that's why we would want to use truly vetted algorithms instead of like, trying to invent your hash functions. Uh, and SHA is uh, one such function, which is usually uh, used across the board and uh, properly vetted. So combining the two, right? The first we saw how to achieve confidentiality with encryption, and uh, we also saw how to, how to use it for integrity. So you can combine the two to provide both confidentiality and integrity. So first send it through the encryption algorithm uh, with the message in the key K to get ciphertext C and uh, pass the ciphertext C uh, and the key K to a hash function to get the tag. And the sender can now send the ciphertext along with the tag. And now the receiver can uh, verify both that it is, uh, it is coming from the sender as well as make sure that no one else can tamper it on the way or look, uh, look at it uh, and find out the original data. Uh, the next type of uh, encryption is asymmetric encryption. It is more popularly uh, known as public key cryptography. So as the name suggests, unlike symmetric encryption, uh, we don't have a shared key here. Instead, it deals with a key pair, a public key and a secret or private key. Uh, the holder of the public key is uh, usually uh, the sender who's going to encrypt the data with the public key. And uh, uh, this ciphertext uh, would be decrypted by, uh, by the receiver uh, using the secret key escape. Uh, to get the message. Uh, so in essence, it's doing the same thing, basically trying to establish confidentiality by encrypting the data, but uh, how it's doing, the inputs to the algorithms are different here. Uh, and the algorithms by themselves are different because they're using a, a key pair. So why would you want to use this versus symmetric encryption, right? Uh, because you have a public key and a secret key, uh, you can keep just a secret key secret and the public key can be available, made available to all the senders that want to send you data. Uh, so this is very popular in uh, uh, HTTPS uh, when you're uh, communicating between a web server and web client through HTTPS. Uh, the web client uh, uh, can be different clients, right? So if all of them have the public key, they can always send you ciphertext uh, of their messages and uh, the web server will decrypt it using its secret key, which is secret only to itself and not available to anyone else. Uh, so in this case, you would want to use asymmetric encryption uh, to provide confidentiality. So if you look at uh, the diagram, uh, the uh, first sender encrypts message one and uh, with the same public key and sends ciphertext one, whereas the one on the bottom, it encrypts message two with the same uh, public key, but gives ciphertext two and uh, uh, the receiver is able to decrypt both using a uh, secret key. Uh, and asymmetric encryption is also used to create signatures, which is to provide non-repudiation and authentication. Uh, here, uh, uh, signing algorithms are used, which uh, the underlying algorithm inside is uh, asymmetric encryption. Signing algorithms, are, so these also work with two uh, keys, secret key and the public key but the role is kind of re reversed. So the signer uses the secret key SK and the verifier uses the public key PK. Uh, when uh, the signing algorithm takes in the message M and the secret key SK and creates a signature, something like the tag that we talked about uh, in symmetric algorithms, right? So uh, this signature along with the message, along the public key is used to verify uh, the signature and make sure that this message belongs to the sender that sent the same signature and it's not being tampered with. Uh, an example application here is digital transactions. Uh, so whenever, uh, whenever you're making a credit card payment or anything online, if you're doing some online transaction, uh, the credit card company or your bank would try to make sure that 
you are the person who used this uh, card, right? So by that, they how they do that is basically like verifying the signature of that particular card transaction to make sure that this is tied to the uh, user that uh, this card belongs to. That is essentially non-repudiation and authentication. Some of the uh, popular asymmetric encryption algorithms are RSA, ECC, Diffie-Hellman. Uh, again, you would want to choose the algorithm that suits your need. Uh, for example, for RSA versus ECC, uh, ECC is a, is a little less uh, uh, computer intensive, so it's usually used in uh, devices which have lower memory, like uh, IoT devices. Excuse me. Uh, and public keys, because they're available to everyone, right? For example, in HTTPS, all web clients have access to this public key, so uh, it's not uh, you know, a secret. So for this reason, they are usually signed by a trusted certificate authority. So again, they use a crypto algorithm to sign uh, this, uh, these public keys uh, to make sure that uh, these trusted certificate authorities are uh, vetted by uh, you know, parties uh, worldwide. And uh, so they trust the certificates that are assigned by CA. And uh, uh, signing the public key, right? okay, this is so any of the public keys, secret keys compromised, you want to be able to, uh, you know, uh, revoke the part th that particular certificate. So for this purpose, a certificate revocation lists are used to revoke compromised or old certificates. And uh, uh, for security purposes, again, uh, keys are rotated from time to time. So you don't want to keep using the same key uh, for a very long period of time because in case it gets compromised, you're compromising even the backward encrypted data, right? So for that reason, keys are also encrypted from time, to, sorry, rotated from time to time. Uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions on the way uh, or we can jump into the next section, which is uh, building secure systems. So we saw how uh, we have is there a question in the. I feel like I've lost you. Can you hear me? Hey. Can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I thought I lost. Okay, uh, let's get back to that. So uh, now in this section, we look at uh, building uh, secure systems. Uh, so uh, we now saw what what app applications cryptography has. Uh, next, we look at uh, how to build an end-to-end -end system uh, with keeping by se keeping security in mind. Uh, so uh, when I say system here, it may not be a system that just does something for security, but any kind of end-to-end -end system uh, or end-to-end -end application or even like an app framework, right? Uh, but by keeping security in mind uh, to make sure that you are not having issues later on uh, that, you know, bring down your entire service. Uh, so how do you design for security? Security is something that needs to be designed for in, early on in the design phase uh, because it's hard to you know, bake in security after the fact. Um, so for that, you would want to first determine the attack surface uh, of your application. Uh, for this, usually they do threat modeling and vulnerability discovery to find out uh, the weak, weak links in your application or your system uh, to find out what kind of security holes you need to plug. Uh, and again, this depends on your use case. Uh, you know, uh, an app doing digital transactions is different from an app uh, which you know is used to like find out restaurants nearby. Um, so the security levels are going to be different depending on your uh, use case. Uh, but at the same time, you should ma make sure that whenever there's user data uh, being accessed, uh, you want to always uh, determine that as the attack surface. Right, user data should not be compromised. Uh, rather than trying to uh, encrypt all the data that you ha keep handling. Uh, you would want to minimize the handling of sensitive data. So uh, uh, use, use data only if need be and destroy it as soon as you're uh, done with it. So minimize the handling of sensitive data so that you would want to like, set, in, set up uh, protection mechanisms only in a lesser number of places. Uh, 
and of course use encryption uh, do not uh, try to store clear text uh, data at least for sensitive data do not store clear text data uh, use uh, already available algorithms and you can use this using open ssl libraries and so on um, the last is defense in depth so what that means is uh, you want to look at security from the perspective of different layers of uh, your application say if you have an end-to-end -end application uh, that has like a back-end database uh, you know reading data from a database and then you have a front-end uh, web uh, api uh, serving uh, you know users through ui so you have like an entire stretch uh, and you would want to have defense mechanism in each layer so at the application layer at the network layer at the database layer and so on so that uh, you know when one, when there's a failure point in one of those applications you're not bring the entire service down uh, uh, and provide a bad user experience right so defense in depth is essentially means that uh, trying to isolate the different layers of your uh, application or your system and uh, defending each so next we look at security and reliability uh, what reliability means is that it is a little different from availability right availability is just uptime of your service uh, whereas reliability essentially means that your service is functional uh, and it functions as expected always at all points of time um, so it's just not there uh, it's just not just available to talk to rather it does what it's expected to do for the most of the time at least uh, so uh, uh, usually security and uh, reliability are at loggerheads because they have different requirements uh, but at the same time they do have some intersection as well uh, in both security and reliability, uh, they are expected features rather than desired features. So whenever you ask a user uh, what, what feature would you like to have, they're not going to say security or reliability. Uh, rather, they expect your application uh, to be secure and reliable. Uh, they are noticed only when it's not working fine. Right? So this, these need to be uh, part of your secure system design considerations uh, so that, again, you're not, uh, you're not uh, baking in security or reliability later on uh, during your application deployment. Uh, and some of the trade-offs that security and reliability have, uh, this is just a couple of them, but there are a lot of trade-offs that you would want to consider. Uh, one of it is redundancy. So uh, when you want to have a highly reliable system, you tend to have redundancy. So uh, for example, if you're having a HTTPS transaction, uh, and that transaction pays, like your HTTPS is not working. Uh, if you're going to fall back to HTTP, uh, that is a security concern now because you're trying to have high reliability, uh, but you're compromising security for that. Uh, but again, this might be okay for uh, not so sensitive data, right? If you're going to sell shoes, it's okay if uh, the, the data about the shoes is being compromised or if it's in clear text. But uh, at the same time, if your shoe store has user login data, you don't want your user data to be available in public just to make sure you have a reliable system. Uh, again, uh, in case of two-factor authentication, uh, you might, uh, uh, it's a security feature, right? Two-factor authentication is a security feature, but uh, in case there is an outage uh, for high reliability, you would want to quickly be able to bring back the system, but two-factor authentication might slow down the process. So again, that is another uh, example of a trade-off that you want to consider between the two. For both security and reliability, uh, you want to design your system with the principle of least privilege in mind. Uh, so what that means is uh, a user or a service should be able to access data only that is required for it and nothing more than that. Um, so essentially restrict uh, privileged data to only particular users or particular services. Uh, this is because unre unrestricted access to data can uh, lead to compromises, uh, not just because of attackers, uh, but this can even be unintentional, un unintentional errors, right? Uh, someone having like really highly privileged access who's on call can do something really, uh, really malicious without knowing it's malicious and bring down the entire service. So you want to always have uh, that you know, uh, separation of privileges. Uh, and uh, this is also to, pro uh, to prevent insider threats uh, so you might be thinking uh, in a large company, there is always uh, you know, the potential for insider threats. So minimizing that, uh, that attack surface is always good by, by following the principle of uh, least privilege. Uh, 
for this, there are also zero touch models, which essentially mean that uh, you're having like extensively automated uh, systems uh, that minimize human access. So everything is uh, checked by a machine or an automation. Uh, for example, even in a software development cycle, uh, if you're a software developer, you're going to like check in code uh, that you write and an automation can keep, always keep a check that you're not checking in anything and everything and it's always being reviewed by at least one more person. Uh, so that kind of model is called a zero touch model where uh, there is less human interaction, but there's still uh, some kind of, uh, you know, checks here and there. Uh, again, you want to make a risk based assessment of uh, when you're trying to segregate access control lists. Uh, so, I, like I mentioned in the previous example, if you're having like a shoe store, uh, make a risk-based assessment or, as to what data is sensitive and what needs to be given high privileges, uh, high privilege access only to certain users. Um, the last is break glass mechanisms for incorrect access deniers. So, what break glass mechanisms are are essentially um, they're a, a doorway. Uh, in case there is like too many outages because of uh, incorrect access denials. So you want some way to be able to access your service, right? Uh, if you're gonna close all the uh, trap doors and uh, uh, not be able to talk to your service when everything is down, uh, you want to have one break glass mechanism at least uh, to make sure that you, get, you can get your service. But again, this should not be abused uh, and this should also be highly restricted uh, to only certain individuals or certain users or certain services so that uh, it's not always being abused whenever there is, you know, uh, a small issue or, or something like that. So in uh, any system uh, design, you want to make sure there are recovery mechanisms in place, whether you have a security issue or you have a reliability issue, uh, you want to make sure that your services back up as soon as possible. And uh, for this, uh, you want to uh, first have a graceful degradation in place. So what does that mean? For example, um, even in Google search, right? Um, during these COVID times, uh, as soon as this, uh, the, the, the first uh, phase of lockdowns and things like that, uh, everyone's gonna go search about COVID, right? Uh, all the search uh, queries are going to be like about COVID, which is going to increase the load on, on the search uh, back then. Uh, so for that, uh, how do you want to deal with this is uh, have a load shedding and throttling mechanism in place. So what that means is essentially you're trying to have some kind of redundancy. You're trying to uh, either like drop uh, uh, too much load. You're not able to, if you're not able to take too much load, just drop uh, the extra requests or move it to another uh, server. And if you're not able to do this, you're, you don't have infinite resources, right? If you're not able to do this, just drop it and uh, error out because this is better than uh, you know, bringing the entire system down. You don't want Google not working for the entire world. Instead, it's okay if some of the search results are not returning uh, results for some time, right? So uh, that is graceful degradation so that you're able to withstand any kind of load even if you don't have the resources for it. Uh, the next one is automatic recovery. So again, whenever uh, your system goes down, you don't want a human to always uh, have to intervene and uh, bring the service back. Uh, and for this, uh, you want to have some kind of automated recovery, even something like uh, a very simple, uh, uh, you know, technique like taking machines off uh, if they are creating like malicious uh, uh, inputs or something like that. So just have some kind of an automated automated recovery in place uh, to be able to have a reliable service. Uh, the last is fail safe versus fail secure. So what does this mean? Uh, Whenever uh, there is a security issue or any, any kind of issue in your system which is bringing it down, uh, you, want to you want to make a decision uh, during system design phase whether you want to fail safe or fail secure. So an example of this is, uh, for example, a, a power plant uh, which is open and uh, if there's an issue somewhere and it has to be shut down. Uh, do you keep the trap doors open so that someone can come and fix the issue? Or do you want to close it so that uh, some attacker cannot come in and uh, access uh, things when they're not working? So that is where you want to make a differentiation. Uh, it's a trade-off again between security and reliability. Uh, it's okay if you're going to keep uh, the trap doors open if there's nothing confidential in there, but it's not okay if uh, it's a highly privileged place which uh, no one should access at that point. You don't want an attacker to take uh, uh, use of the fact that your system is going down right now. So detection and incident management. So after uh, all this uh, security design and everything, 
you still cannot uh, you know be sure that there is no no breach possible or no attack possible uh, you want to make sure that you are equipped to handle any kind of uh, breach or incident that might happen uh, for this uh, you want to uh, keep some kind of monitoring and alerting uh, in place so uh, make sure that there are uh, all your weak links uh, are uh, always being monitored so that as soon as there's an intrusion or an attack uh, your system or you're, you're getting emailed uh, uh, or some kind of alerting mechanism to know that uh, there's some kind of issue going on uh, in your system. And once this happens, uh, you're going to make an impact analysis, uh, uh, which is basically looking at what, what the issue is, or at least first find out who is being impacted. Is it user data being compromised uh, or is it just internal data being compromised? So things like that. Uh, find out what the impact is first. Uh, and investigate uh, what can be done to mitigate it first. Rather than like trying to find the right bug fix there, uh, the first uh, uh, first thing to do would be mitigation uh, to make sure that there is not a widespread uh, issue and try to control the problem. Uh, and after the fact, uh, we can make use of audit logs. So auditing needs to definitely be done uh, to make sure. So audit logs are essentially like having logs, uh, internal logs in uh, critical pathways to make sure that you always know what's going on uh, in those critical sections so that uh, when there's an issue like this, you can look at the audit logs and make uh, corresponding actions to strengthen these uh, weak links uh, because it would be hard to, uh, you know, not repeat this problem if this is not done. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I thought I'll just uh, scratch the surface of the intersection between uh, blockchain and security. I don't have too much hands-on experience with blockchain, but uh, I have more reading and these kind of conference knowledge. So uh, some thoughts on this is, uh, as you might be more aware than I am, blockchain uses cryptography again, just like uh, security, to form a series of blocks that represent a transaction. And innately, uh, it has the properties uh, integrity and non-repudiation. So um, essentially, when you make smart contracts, it, it ties uh, the user to the transaction, right? So uh, innately, it has a non-repudiation property and integrity. So there is potential for uh, usage of blockchain uh, in security, uh, in security, in the security arena. Uh, it also has no central point of failure. It has a distributed ledger. So uh, considering that. Uh, like just like just as I mentioned about secure system designs, uh, you want to not have one central point of failure which brings your entire service down. So again, to think of it from that perspective, uh, blockchain is a good uh, use case for uh, you know having a more reliable system. And uh, when I was just thinking about this, I was thinking about a potential application where uh, there's a chain of trust, such as a boot time attestation. And uh, why I'm saying that is because uh, blockchain is uh, forming a chain of blocks uh, to make sure that the transaction is uh, secure, right? So when there's a chain of trust uh, in boot time attestation, what we do is uh, you're, uh, when a machine boots, starting from the uh, firmware, um, you, the next, the next uh, loaded module verifies the previous module. Uh, so when there's a firmware, the bootloader and the operating system, the bootloader verifies that the firmware loaded is the, lo uh, is the correct firmware and the operating system makes sure that the boot bootloader is what is expected. So that is a chain of trust. And uh, when I was thinking about this, I already saw a paper that is, uh, you know, working on this. So this is one of, one of the examples that, uh, poten that's a potential application of uh, blockchain uh, in security. And I'm sure there are uh, uh, more such cases that are, uh, uh, in this interesting space because blockchain is still uh, in its you know, growing phase. Uh, and I have added that link here. And I think that's pretty much all I had. And these are the references that I used, uh, Foundation Security. And uh, this book, Building Secure and Reliable Systems uh, by Google is open to all. So you can uh, take a look at that. It's uh, really useful. It also uh, talks about how Google secures its infrastructure and uh, I was surprised that there is a lot of uh, detail into that. So you can look at how uh, it's done at Google. And uh, the root of trust case that I just talked about uh, for blockchain application is also linked here. And that's all I had. Uh, we can take any questions if you have. Yeah, it looks like um, there were a couple of questions. I know you stopped partway through um, oh, okay. to look. Sorry. 
Yeah, there, but I was not able to look at it. Okay, yeah, I can but, I can look at them now. But have we have we answered this one? How do we trust the public keys that are generated by trusted CA? Okay, so uh, yeah, that's a good question. So when uh, uh, when I say when I said that, let me go to the slide again. So for example, uh, let, me, uh, let me take an example. So if you have a TPM, so it's a trusted plot platform module, and uh, it, it comes with a key, right? It comes with a public key. And how you usually check that is, uh, uh, check that it is being generated by a trusted uh, TPM manufacturer, uh, is that the, the uh, trusted TPM manufacturer will have its own CA. And uh, the CA will, will give the public key open to all. And uh, it has used a secret key to sign this particular TPM's uh, public key. Uh, and we can pass this through the verify function uh, of uh, the asymmetric algorithm. And uh, that would uh, give us, essentially, this is the block. This is the uh, block that we want to see. So this verify over here would take in the public key, the certificate, uh, and uh, use the public key of the CA uh, to verify that uh, this is coming from a trusted TPM, which is signed by a trusted CA. I hope that answered the question. That's really great. Um, the other question that we have is, if we have to encrypt, say asymmetrically, a message from multiple people, like in the application of a group chat for a thousand people, do we have to encrypt it for a thousand people and store all the encrypted data? Is this the correct way or is there a scalable way to do it? Uh, if you have to encrypt a message for multiple people. Okay. You have to encrypt for a thousand people and store all that. No. So in this case, it's a group chat, right? So uh, you want to encrypt only the communication. You're not going to want to store all the uh, data uh, encrypted. This is uh, different from, uh, say, WhatsApp. Right. Uh, so in, in WhatsApp, again, when you're saying end to end encryption, the encryption is just for the communication layer. Uh, and uh, there is no encryption for the storage. So it all depends on how your device stores it. So if you're going to make just a group chat, uh, your responsibility will, will only be in the network layer. Uh, so during the transaction, uh, you're going to secure it. You wouldn't want to, it's not your responsibility to be able to, uh, you know, encrypt it after, uh, after the fact or essentially you don't want to st store so much uh, encrypted data for a group chat application. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, another question we've got that's come up in the chat is, how can we decrypt the data if the encryption of data is done on rotation basis? Uh, how can you decrypt the data if, what do you mean by rotation? Do you mean like key rotation? Uh, if you're talking about key rotation, uh, yes, uh, key rotation is in intended to not be able to decrypt uh, data with older keys. So whenever you're going to rotate keys, uh, you're going to make sure that uh, the previously uh, uh, encrypted uh, uh, data is rekeyed with the new key uh, so that they can be uh, decrypted with the new key. So if you do not do that, like you said, uh, you're not going to be able to decrypt uh, data that is being used, that has been encrypted using a key which is uh, being rotated out. Great, thanks for answering that one. Um, it's been a really insightful session and I think folks have really, really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going you. to grab my screen here and share a couple of last things. Mm -hmm. um, share my screen. Wait for it. There it is. So just a couple of final things about women who code. Um, Sapphire was telling you earlier that we are a community that is here for each other. And one way we do that is using these applaud hers. Applaud hers are acknowledgments of professional accomplishments, such as obtaining a new technical job, receiving promotions, speaking at a conference, learning a new programming language, or stepping up as a woman who code leader in your network. Um, so these look a little like this. And what you do is you go in, we'll come back to this link for a second, womenwhocode.com slash applaud her, and you can nominate somebody 
uh, if they got a new job, if they've been doing great at something new and technical, um, you can go there. You can also go in our Slack channel in blockchain and nominate folks, and then they will get featured on our Women Who Code page. So this is a really great way to promote um, the women in technology that are working on great things around you. And as I said earlier, you can also get involved um, with the blockchain or the data science um, tracks that Sapphire and I are um, leading. Um, so we are developing some new volunteer roles over the summer. Um, we're always looking for more speakers, especially in blockchain. Um, we'd be really happy to hear from you. If you are interested in contributing, um, just email me, naomi at womenwhocode.com. And you can also follow us a whole bunch of places. Um, we've got the Twitter, we've got the Instagram. Like I said, you can get on to our Slack channel. I really hope that you'll be able to join us there. Um, we have study groups. Uh, we, we get all the recordings of the videos. Um, a recording of this video will go out uh, on YouTube, on Women Who Code YouTube channel a few days after the event, if you want to go back and review this information. And we'll be announcing more events um, over the summer and into the autumn uh, through our Twitter and on this blockchain events page. So I just want to thank you all for uh, being here today. And I want to thank our speaker very much. Um, it was a wonderful, engaging technical chat and I really appreciated learning. I think that's about everything for today. Thanks, thanks for this opportunity. It was really great talking to you all. I'm so glad we could have you here. Thank you so much. See you all. Thank you. Bye.